Hey everybody, it's Timothy here with Jank Diver Game, and welcome back to a um, tier ranking of all of the monocolored cards in the unrestricted cube. This is the fourth video looking at the red cards. I will skip the whole spiel here. I did get some feedback on the um, white tier list after posting that, and honestly, these are all going to be recorded by the time most of them go up, so I'm not going to be able to apply a lot of feedback, but some people were saying that they had trouble ranking their own cards because of these headings. Uh, look, it's a tier list. <laughs> Don't put a lot of stock in like the actual words and stuff. This is roughly best to worst, you know, the absolute all-star cards go in the top, the cuttable cards go in the bottom, and you can kind of rank the middle stuff however you want. They're not rigid, strict rules. So if you're going to participate in this, don't don't think that just because a card doesn't literally go in 100% of decks that you can't put it in S tier if you think it's like an S tier quality card. It, it's really, I mean, you know how tier lists work. They're all finicky and <laughs> uh, none of the really decision making points matter that much. This is just a fun exercise for me to express how I feel about all the individual cards. Um, also got the feedback back that it might be just a little bit too long at an hour but talking about 51 cards a lot of this is for me to kind of catch up with my own thoughts so you know regardless of whether people watch through to the end or not uh, or skip ahead just to see the final tier list like I enjoy putting this sort of content out there if for no other reason than it lets me kind of give all my evaluations and you know consider where I'm at with everything so we are going to look at red cards before we do. As always, like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you can support us by joining our Discord, which is linked down below, and either giving your own feedback on our cubes, um, hanging out, and just giving us, uh, you know, your best draft tips for the latest draft format, or actually joining us for a Sunday night unrestricted cube draft or a Wednesday night peasant cube draft. But enough chit chat. Have the same spiel for four videos now. Let's go ahead and rank the red cards in the unrestricted cube. All right, first up is Monastery Swift Spear, which was a pleasant little reprint from Brothers War. This is a tried and true classic red aggressive creature, red spell based creature, red aggro creature, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start this one up in A tier. Uh, we don't have the density of spells and stuff to really make this card skyrocket like it does in Constructed. Like sometimes you get this up to a 3 4. But you're not going like Lava Dart you, Sack of Land, Lava Dart you, Mistress Bobble, attack you for like four or five in the same turn. That doesn't really happen. But Swift Spear very regularly attacks as a 2-3 and, you know, very occasionally a 3-4 and above. But um, as just a cheap prowess creature, it does the job that it's here to do. And it's a classic. It performs well. I would put this in low A tier, so I expect it to get bumped down a little bit. Um, red is also very well, variable. There are red aggressive decks, red graveyard decks, red mid-range decks, red control decks, red spells decks. Like, there's a whole bunch of different stuff, so it's kind of hard to be an S-tier card, but there are a few down here. Soul Scar Mage is up next. Very similar um, to Monastery Swift Spear. Has a whole block of text that doesn't really come up until it does, and then nobody remembered that <laughs> it had that text, and you're like, why did this happen? Um, Soul Scar Mage, I'm going to put in the exact same category as Swift Spear. The decks that want Swift Spear usually want Soul Scar Mage, although there are some like Boros aggro decks that are less interested in Soul Scar Mage and more interested in Monastery Swift Spear because it has haste. But um, for the most part, if you're interested in one, you are interested in the other. And realistically, these might be bumped down to B tier. In fact, I don't know. A tier, my kind of, um, I know S says first pick, but my, my kind of caveat for whether a card belongs in A or should be bumped down to B is whether or not I would be willing to first pick it in a pack with weaker cards. And I don't think I would actually first pick either of these. So why don't we temper our expectations a little bit and bump these down to B. Um, Grim Lava Mancer. Again, the, the ranking doesn't matter that much. Like, <laughs> it's it's not that important, y'all, to tier list. Um, Grim Lava Mancer. This card is effective, but I, I find... Its best role is to come in out of the sideboard once you know the matchup. There are, uh, you know, aggro versus control matchups where this card just doesn't matter at all. And then there's creature versus creature matchups where this card actively turns your graveyard into removal against your opponent. Um, I'm not a huge fan of cards that you're pretty much always incentivized to sideboard, which is how I feel about Grim Lava Mancer. So I'm going to put it in a C, although once it comes in out of the sideboard... It does a pretty good job of controlling your opponent's small creatures, so that keeps it out of the D category. And as you'll see, we're playing one or two red one drops that were not like 
huge on, or at least I'm not huge on, so it's not like Grim Lava Master is even the first cut once we get something better in the spot. Like, if we got Goblin Man, uh, Goblin Guide, we would probably cut something else before we cut Lava Mancer. Falcon Wrath Pit Fighter. Just a 2-1 for red and 2. This is like classic C. For whatever reason, the 2-1s in red are just less important than the 2-1s in white. Um... I don't know if people find that to be a controversial statement or not, but that this extra text on this card ends up mattering so little that this is basically just a vanilla red creature. And red has a lot fewer of these um, Savannah lines to choose from than white. It, it's just not a great card. It's just a literal curve filler for your one drop slot if you're looking for a high density of one drop. So Falcon Wrath Pit Fighter I have pretty low, even though you will play it more often than not in your red aggressive decks. Uh, Rabbit Battery. Um, I don't know if people are still defending this card. There there was a time where the card quality was a little bit lower, where I thought Rabbit Battery was justifiable in the cube, but I do think this is, like, probably the worst red card in the cube right now. It has some cool upside. Obviously, you play it on turn one, you nug your opponent a little bit, and then it's like a haste enabler from that point forward, but it doesn't really get... You don't really get to do the thing where you reconfigure to save the Rabbit Battery, and even if you do, like leaving this creature behind isn't the most impressive way to like salvage your board after a wrath. So <laughs> um, while it can do cool things and, you know, giving your creatures haste is always sweet, that usually means you're playing off curve and it's just not impressive. I think this is the weakest red card for sure and uh, possibly the weakest card in the cube right now. Again, density reasons. We'll cut this in a heartbeat if we get better quality red one drops. Darcy is up next. Dragon's Rage channeler um this card takes a little bit it's it's got a little bit of a build around appeal to it but most decks that are interested in red one drops have the spell density to make this just incidentally work and then it's actively great in the spells oriented decks i think this actually is a one drop that cracks a territory because of how good it is as a one drop in the decks that really want this when you get to fill up your graveyard start digging and then start nugging for three in the air off of just your one drop with like no other work it's um that that's the sign that you have a very good one drop on your hand and i think most decks that want these like little prowess creatures equally want dragon's rage channel and it just offers a little bit more if you think about it this kind of is like a prowess creature that takes a little bit of deck construction and it, it's these delirium cards that make me like mishra's bobble and little trinkety cards a little bit more it makes you draft just a little bit differently to get that density of different card types to make delirium work and i appreciate that quite a bit bowmat courier so bowmat courier used to be one of my favorite cards certainly dropped off certainly dropped off a little bit um at one point this probably was like our best red one drop but we didn't have darcy monastery swift spear um, comparable cards like that. So <laughs> it was slim pickings for a little while. I think Bomat Courier falls into B category or ca category, and I think low B. It does present a dilemma to your opponent. Your opponent does have to deal with a Bomat Courier eventually. Like if they're a deck that can't block it in combat, they are going to have to use a removal spell to get rid of it at some point. Otherwise, you're just going to recharge your hand. And then from your perspective, you have to play the mini game of like, do I try to get one more card? Do I play off curve so that I can keep a mana up in case they try to remove it? I think it raises enough different situations or leads to enough different situations where it is just an interesting, good card, even though it doesn't like punch for a lot of damage and it can be stopped by, you know, a fart in the wind, but um, still holds up definitely better than some of these low tier red one drops, particularly rabbit battery. And Falcon Wrath, because the upside on it is so high for a one drop, but I will admit it's not in the run-in for like best one drops anymore. Young Pyromancer. Young Peasy. Um, we got this card from a jump start thing. In fact, we had an early rule in our cubes that we weren't going to play cards that were released outside of just normal standard draftable sets. And then they released Jumpstart that had, like, the Blood Artist and Young Pyro, and we're like, we would be missing out on a lot if we didn't include cards like this. So we, we um, trashed that rule, and now we're open to basically anything that's been printed on Arena. Young Pyro um, is just a Spells Matters card through and through. I actually think it's in B territory. In fact, I think Young Pyromancer is, like, slowly dropping down the ranks, but... 
as a spells payoff, we still want a few of those. In fact, we, we still have quite a few of those. But uh, I think it's decent. I actually almost want to put it below the prowess creatures because there are just games where the fragile body gets dealt with, the tokens all get swept up at once with the young pyro. The way this was described to me when I first started playing Magic and Pyromancer was like a big deal in Legacy, um, I didn't quite understand why making a bunch of 1-1s was that good, and somebody described it to me as, uh, you know, it's the best way to turn a bunch of spells into damage. You know, you, you fill a deck with just tons of instants and sorceries, and the question is, well, how are you actually winning? Well, you have cards like Young Pyromancer that convert those spells into damage. I think with the advent of, like, cheap prowess creatures, you already have things that kind of do that um, while pressuring on their own. And Young Pyromancer is maybe, like, a step behind these days. But it's a classic. It still holds up a little bit, even if I think there are better versions of this effect now. I don't think we're uh, clamoring to cut it anytime soon. All right, next up, Blood thirsty adversary i believe um a card that's been on the chopping block lately but some people like it it has its fans it's not a terrible card nice flexibility to it um blood adver or bloodthirsty adversary is another b for me yeah obviously lots of b's doesn't quite crack that territory you're never first picking this card um even if you know you're in a tech that can use it like you wouldn't first pick it second third pick or second or third pack you would try to wheel it i think so i'm gonna put this in low b um I think we talked about cutting this recently, and I believe it was Teld who defended the card and said the flexibility of it is nice, and we agree. Being able to just play it on two and start dealing damage or draw it late and get a two for one out of it is nice utility, even though neither mode is like super efficient or anything like that. So I think the card is fine. I think uh, it is eventually cuttable, but for now, since it's in the cube, like you can draft it, you can play it, and it, it'll fill a role just fine. So... I'm not disappointed to have a Bloodthirsty Adversary in my deck, and it does feel nice when you get to kick it, make a 3-3 haste, and, like, bolt your opponent from your graveyard. Kenra Spell Spear? Yeah, Kenra Spell Spear. So this is the um, Transform card from March of the Machine. Turns into the Double Prowess creature. Um, I'm, I'm kind of coming down on creatures that you have to invest extra mana into. I spoke poorly of Surge Engine. I marked it against um, the Evolved Sleeper as well. Uh, if, if you absolutely need to dump extra mana into your creature to get it to a point where it's good, then I think I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm more hesitant to give it a high grade. I played with this card a lot during a recent Rotisserie draft, and on some occasions, this card just won the game on its own. Like, I was able to get it to the backside. They couldn't pay Ward 2. I rattled off a couple spells, and they died. But I don't think the front half of this card is super impressive, especially since we'll talk about Abbott here in a second. And I do think you have to get to the backside, but then you open yourself up for opportunities to just, you know, get completely tempoed out by spending all this mana or life or whatever. So I think while this card has really good upside... I don't think it is a long time contender for the cube, and I'm going to start it off in like low C because of that. Um, even though like if you're in a spell-based deck, you can play this card. It's it's not like the crux of your deck, though. Look how many spell-based cards we've already talked about in the just one and two drop slots. One, two, three, four, five, right? So it's replaceable. It, you know, it's never the most important part in card in your deck and these cards are largely interchangeable so i don't know how long this card will be around i had good results with it but i also played plenty of games where it's just like i can't really do much with this right now my opponent's got open mana i can't really invest into the activated ability and i do think you have to regularly be able to get to the gataxian spell stalker in order for this card to be good um, magda is up next a card that has come down in my estimation a little bit but still falls into solid b territory for me um, the problem with this is you don't always get a clean attack with it. Uh, if you do get a clean attack, like you play this on turn two, your opponent just doesn't have a blocker, then yeah, you get to ramp ahead and then potentially spiral out of control if your opponent can't stop Magda from attacking. But I don't think that play pattern happens very often. Again, you're playing Q. People have tons of ones and two drops. There's always interaction. Um, there's always something that your opponent's doing unless they're just a greedy four color deck that can't play to the board on turn two or three. So Magda doesn't get that clean attack in very often anymore. Um, now that we've kind of downsized everything, we've pushed everything lower on the curve. There's so much cheap removal and interaction. So I think Magda is going to fall somewhere to the bottom 
of the B tier. Um, still a good card, still perfectly fine. Just it has a lot of text that ends up not mattering. One of my favorite things to do with Magda is use it to crew Reckoner Bankbuster because it gets you a treasure without actually having to attack with it. So that's nice. Kari Zev. Kari Zev has been around for a while for us, and I think it holds up. Um, Kari Zev is one of, in my opinion, one of the best red aggressive creatures. Um, so much so that I'm going to put this in A tier. And maybe that's wild to some people to put Kari Zev over some of these other cards, but you don't have to put in any work for Kari Zev. As long as you care about reducing your opponent's life total to zero, Kari Zev is a good card for you. It's essentially like a 3 3 first strike menace divided across two bodies. And sometimes you have ways to use the Ragavan body before it goes away. It's hard to block the important part of this card. And it just pushes through so much damage. Um, I've been, everybody's been very successful whenever they put a Kari Zev in their aggressive deck. It's one of those cards that you just curve into it. Your opponent thinks they're blocking your two drop and they just don't have an answer for it because of Menace. And then, you know, what are they going to trade their two drop for the Ragavan token that's just going to come back? I don't think so. So Kari Zev, always impressed with this card. I um, think this one's sticking around. It's one of our better aggressive two drops. Abbot of Carol Keep. We just got this card in an anthology. Um, I haven't seen this card in Constructed in quite a while. I know it was a big deal when it first came out and has dropped off significantly, but we just got through talking about the Spell Spear, right? There's Young Pyromancer. There's plenty of these two-mana creatures that fit in spell-based strategies, and Abbot of Carol Keep just has the ability to be a straight-up two-for-one and draw you an extra card. There's a little bit of a time-in restriction on it, but as a creature that can draw you into extra spells and also is a benefit for casting extra spells, I think it's got to be pretty high up on the tier list. I'm going to go ahead and tentatively put this above all of the other spell-based, like, prowessy creatures, because it just straight-up draws you a card majority of the time, and maybe there's, like, blink strategies and stuff that can even take advantage of this, but um, I think it's comparable in terms of its damage output to all these other cards, and the the floor of, like, almost always just cantripping on ETB is a really good spot to be. Earthshaker Kenra. Uh, Red has a <laughs> Red has pretty flat power level here. <laughs> lots of bees, lots of bees. Um, Earthshaker Kenra. So this is a tried and true aggressive card as well. It's not in that spellsy kind of category. It's more in the like just aggro Kari Zev Magda category. Um, it's like a flat out bee. Not the most impressive aggressive creature you can get. Never that bad. Gives you some um, incentive to play like graveyard based stuff because of Eternal Eyes. Two for one, just naturally. Solid B, like exactly in the middle. I'll go ahead and put it above the Bomat Courier, but below the spell based stuff um, because it is replaceable, but it's very good when you do put it in your deck. All right, that leads us into Arcanist. Banned in Legacy, possibly the best two drop ever printed. Uh, Orcish Bowmasters has something to say about that. Um, Dread Horde Arcanist. So here's the thing about Dread Horde Ar Arcanist. This is not a necessary part of the cube. In fact, th this is like what I mean when I talk about experimental. It's a strong card if you build towards it, but you do need a very high density of one mana spells in order for it to tick. And even then, if you shape an entire deck around this card and you either never draw it or your opponent kills it on site or they have like incidental graveyard hate, it can be extremely lackluster. So it's one of the cards in the cube that requires you to do a little bit more than just draft powerful cards. And I like that. I'm not putting it in D because it's a bad card. When you build around it, it's a really strong card. I'm putting it in D because it asks a lot more of you than most of the other cards that are just like generically powerful. You can't just put Dreadhorde or Arcanist in a red deck and expect it to do something. You have to actively draft like six, seven, eight one drop spells. I do like that you can put this in red, blue, or red, black. Um, I suppose there's probably a reason to put it in red, white every now and then if you have like swords to plowshares and stuff like that. But being able to flashback like a Fatal Push or Thought Seize in black is just as good as being able to flashback like a red removal spell in red. So um, I think there will come a time where we decide to go ahead and nix this just because it is a little more situational than the other two drops. But it is a really fun card for now, and we're not really um, going out of our way to get rid of it. There's other two drops we can mess around with, like this next one, Dragonkin Berserker. Um, 
I talked about Sun Gold Sentinel in my first video, in the white video, and how that card comes in and comes out and comes in and comes out. And every time we have a two drop slot open and a placeholder and there's nothing that we immediately want to play, we're like, why don't we test this card out? That's basically exactly where I am with Dragonkin Berserker. I'm not going to put it in D because it is actually a decent card on the battlefield. It has that whole like army in a can thing where you can actually just win the game off the back of this card sometimes. But as a two drop, it's like just a decent little two drop. Nothing wrong with it at all. And, uh, you know, it's just not pulling a particular strategy. It's not saying it's not it's not encouraging you to do anything other than just like attack and sometimes that's sometimes that's fine so i think it's realistically like right here if you're red aggro you'll just play the card and you'll be reasonably happy with it but um you could go an entire draft never see the card and not even think about it all right chugging along red three drops tend to be very good these days it's always a hard sell to cut a card for a new red three drop uh reckless Storm Seeker is the werewolf. Again, I hate Daybound, Nightbound. Thankfully, this card is like just as powerful on the front as it is on the back. Or at least obviously the back half is more powerful, but like the the center of the power is on the front half of the card. It's just an amplified version on the back. So as a like baseline three mana three three haste, this is a decent little card. And then Sometimes you play this, smash your opponent, play a four drop, give it haste, smash your opponent. It, it does lead to some pretty ridiculous curve outs for Gruul, which happens to be like one of the best color combinations at the time. So got to rate this one a little bit highly. I still don't think it's A tier, but I will put it at the top end of B. I think Abbott is just super, super good. I might be wrong about that, but let's go ahead and stick it up at the top here. Just very powerful. Legion Warboss. Legion Warboss. Uh, a Rabble Master variant. For reference, we don't actually have Goblin Rabble Master on Arena. We have Legion War Boss and we have Squee, and then I think we're playing Handwear Garrison as well. This is a fine little creature that's just like, hey, here's a dude, here's a dude, here's a dude. You can put it in your aggro deck, you can put it in your Aristocrats deck and just sack the tokens, and then if your opponent doesn't have an answer and you're you're playing like against a control opponent or something, you just play this and win the game. So it's powerful. Um it is a replaceable three drop. I don't know necessarily that I would take it over some of the other threes here, but a uh, solid little B. Um, it gets the job done probably in the ballpark of like the spells oriented card. Sometimes you land this on turn three, your opponent doesn't have an immediate plan and they fall so far behind. Season Pyro. So Season Pyromancer is interesting because we played Fable of the Mirror Breaker for a while and it turned out Fable was significantly better than Pyro, which I'll give Chris some credit for that one. He called that one. Uh, we all fought him on it like, nah, I think Pyromancer is better, but I think everybody agrees now that Fable of the Mirror Breaker is better, which we cut from the queue, by the way. Season Pyromancer, I'm going to go ahead and give a low A. Um, actually, I'll put it above Kari Zev. And the reason is not because it's hyper powerful, but because it fits in as many different red decks as you can imagine. There are these grindy Rakdos decks that care about filling up the graveyard and having Delirium and stuff like that, and Pyromancer's good there. It's not at its best in aggro, but at the very least, it can filter some lands into some extra spells. And then, of course, you have to give credit to the fact that sometimes you run this out with an empty hand and you just straight up draw two cards, which is very powerful. Also, benefits from being milled over, discarded, just a well-rounded, well-designed card. Not busted for a Modern Horizons card, which <laughs> is usually that set, set symbol, wherever it is, is usually the hallmark of a ridiculous card. So I like A for Season Pyromancer. I could see myself first picking it just to keep myself open to a lot of different red routes. Phoenix of Ash. Um, Phoenix of Ash we actually cut for a little while because we wanted to give the blue control deck some breathing room and we had just a really high density of creatures that could just come back from the graveyard anytime you killed them and not enough exile to deal with all of those so black had all of its recursive creatures and then red had random escape creatures like this and it was really tough for blue to keep up with multiple colors um we feel like blue is a little bit better positioned now so phoenix of ash came back as just a nice grindy creature that's hard to keep down for good and it does end games. Um, I want to put it in B, and I want to put it in high B. I'll put it above Reckless Storm Seeker because of its resilience to a lot of different types of removal and uh, contributing to more of a red grindy game plan than just an all-in aggro or spells-based game plan. I wouldn't be surprised if like Chris did this and put it at A because I know he's very fond of the card, but I think 
um, high B is kind of where I want it to land. Bone Crusher. So we talked about Brazen Borrower, which I gave an S. We talked about Murderous Rider, which I gave a much lower grade, but I'm going to put Bone Crusher at S. Um, there are other S's in the same category as this, but this card is just absurd. Even on five mana, you just play it as a four, three that deals two to something that's like fine. But the curve of this one is so powerful. Just take out your two drop and now deal with my extra card. And I got a two for one off of it. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> um, when you get to snipe a two drop with it, it goes to face. So, you know, that extra little bit of burn, if you have, if your opponent doesn't even play a creature, you're just like, okay, I'll, I'll burn you for two. And I basically got that incidentally for free. And then if you can ever do things like bounce it back to your own hand or anything, you get to reuse the adventure. I think this is just one of Red's best possible cards in this cube. And uh, very happy to first pick it. Uh, this one and Brazen Borrower are the two best by a long shot. Hand Weir, Garrison, and no, we're not playing the stupid land to go with it. This is um, this is our other Rabble Master variant. This one is more of a like uh play it fingers crossed hope it <laughs> hope it survives it is one of the ones that benefits from haste enablers so rabbit battery makes this a little bit better but then you're talking about doing that on turn four instead of three so whatever um reckless seeker there's a couple other haste enablers and stuff like that uh unopposed this card's obviously fantastic but it is a frail enough body that it stops from reaching the high tiers i believe there are also red decks that just are not interested in playing creatures like this to the board so I think this falls in like mid to low B. I would probably take Earthshaker Kenra over it. So I would probably take Bomat Quarry over it. So yeah, this feels like a good spot for Handware Garrison to lean. Um, maybe one day we can sneak that land in just to see if we can live the dream. Hellrider. <laughs> Hellrider has somehow survived the entirety of the unrestricted cube. However many years we've been doing this, Hellrider has been there the full time. And it's kind of like, look at the four drops. They're, every four drop in red is like a 4-4 four, four dragon with some upside, and they're just not interested in cards. Hellrider is a little bit different from, you know, the swath of other creatures we could be playing. And it is just like an absolute, excuse my language, it, it's it's a hell of a finisher, right? <laughs> a Hellrider of a finisher. So... Um, it doesn't go in every deck. You wouldn't put this in your spells deck. I do see people put it in decks where it makes me scratch my head a little bit, but at the top end of like your just heavy creature deck that's playing dorks and doesn't really care about what those dorks are doing, um, I think it's quite good. So uh, B for power level, but you know, taking a knock on flexibility a little bit. The one drops are a little bit more important. I think it's a better finisher than some of these other cards here. Okay, Moonvale Regent. Um, this has been in and out of the cube about two or three times. This is what I'm talking about with the dragons. You know, you can compare all these four mana, four, four dragons with upside and they all do different things. Um, this one's a little bit better than most of them. It does have the potential to just do like really powerful things in decks with super low curves where the idea is you, you use this as the last card in your hand and then you cast a spell, draw a new card, cast a spell, draw a new card, and you just kind of like storm off with it. It's also just like dies to doom blady and you get some damage on the way out. So while I think it's good, I don't think it's that impressive. Everything I said about fours and five drops during this series is true for this card. You just don't need that many of them. So you could pass this card easily, even though sometimes it makes your deck and it's good. You just don't need it in order for a deck to function. There's no deck out there that is worse because it didn't get Moonvale Regent. So I'm going to put this at C, like serviceable, playable, actually pretty strong a decent amount of the time but not something I would ever come close to first picking. This is like the red finisher I get when I didn't get the finisher I wanted, which some people disagree with that, but I'm not huge on the card. I know Chris is a lot higher than me, and I, I have seen this card do cool things. I've also seen it be like pretty miserable against some very efficient removal or exile effects and stuff like that. Rekindling Phoenix. This is a red four drop that i like a lot another control hoser if you will against the wrath of gods and stuff there's so many times that i think i'm stable against somebody and then they play rekindle in phoenix and i'm like that is a problem for me because <laughs> i have these removal spells in my hand i'm gonna either have to two for one myself or just have to find an answer for rekindle in phoenix every turn for the rest of the game i like it a lot more than moonvale regent i think it's a much more flexible card even though it is kind of like a gruel card you could theoretically put this at the top end of like your red aggro deck even though there's a lot of competition for like boros four drops pretty much any four drop will do i think hell rider is the best for specific specifically aggro i think moonvale is the best for specifically a spells based deck 
and this is just like a stompy creature. If you can play a two drop mana dork and then a turn three rekindle on Phoenix, your opponent's in a lot of trouble. So I'm going to give this a nod over the regent. I don't think it's an untouchable card though. Like we can absolutely get rid of it if we need to. Um, let's put it below hell rider. Actually it goes in more decks than hell rider. This feels right. Yeah, it feels good. Glory bringer. Oh, glory bringer. What a messed up card. <laughs> um, so I'm between A and S on this. I kind of want to go A on it. I will go very high A to the point where it's like an honorary S. Um, I know Teld specifically, if you're listening, correct me if I'm wrong. I know Teld is going to put this as an S. And I, 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 we've talked about red cards before with Roto Draft and what order you're supposed to prioritize them in. And a couple people said that they put Glory Bringer in like their top three. I think it's edged out just a tiny bit by some of the other ones that I will actually put in S tier. But realistically, you could first pick a Glory Bringer and it's always going to be good. Uh, it's, it's hard for this card to be good. This is part of the reason we don't play a lot of red five drops like gold span dragon and stuff like that is because gory bringer kind of has a monopoly on good red five drops already and anything by comparison is just obviously worse so i'm gonna put it as like the top most a card um even though i, I wouldn't fight anybody if they put it in an s inferno titan as mentioned in the black video we are playing a couple of the titans inferno prime time and grave titan Inferno Titan is a powerful six drop in a cube that doesn't really need six drops, but it's a classic. It is a powerful card that I think justifies the mana cost. Um, we will see how important it is. Six drops, I, I have learned my lesson at this point that no matter how powerful the card is, once you get to six mana, seven mana in a non-ramp color, you're talking about a card that people uh, just won't play a decent amount of the time. Now, I think inferno titan has enough of a pedigree around it that people will play it because it's a classic card but i could see this just not panning out because its mana cost is so high in a cube where you're playing just so many ones and twos and efficient threes and they're efficient answers so inferno titan is i want to put it in a but i think my expectation is that it's like a mid-tier b and doesn't get drafted a decent amount of the time so i'm gonna stick it exactly in the middle of b all right bedlam reveler so I keep referencing this um, Revel, or I keep referencing this Roto draft we did, where I kind of went really hard on blue red spells to try and enable cards like this. And Bedlam Reveler was one of the more disappointing cards. If you go back to the blue video and you listen to my thoughts on Thing in the Ice, I feel very similar to Bedlam Reveler. I found a lot of situations where it was hard to cast this card for less than four or five mana, just because even though we have a bunch of one mana spells, we still don't have such a large quantity of them or mill effects and stuff like that to get this card down to like two or three mana regularly. I found that every time I cast it, I usually actually had to pitch cards from my hand that I wanted to keep, but I was kind of priced into playing this just to get something on board. So I think this card is a little bit unimportant at the moment. Um, very similar to Thing in the Ice. It's fine, but it only goes in one deck, and people fight over the cards that make that deck tick. So um, I think this one probably needs to be in the conversation for coming out just due to how rigid it is. Um, if it went in more decks, we could talk about it, but it's really a blue-red spells deck, and the, that <laughs> that deck has tons of support already. So not, not a necessary card. Chandra, Torch of Defiance. This card won me money at a GP. Um, this is an S tier Planeswalker. There was a lot of discussion at one point about whether or not we take this card out because it's just like the obvious pick over so many other things when you see it in a pack. I think it's okay to have a couple cards like this, especially, I mean, this is what you want your top end to look like. Chandra is a very powerful card, but it doesn't single-handedly decide games. Um, it can if you've got the right support and cast, but like any other Planeswalker, like a Sorin or something like that. Um, it just, it is a multifaceted, diverse card that fills a lot of different roles, card advantage, ramp, removal, an emblem that can win the game if you get there. It's a powerful card. It's the top of red stuff. It goes in a lot of different red decks. Pretty much any red deck I've talked about in this video already can slot Chandra into good effect. So at the very least, it gets, um, the nod for being a first pickable card that can go into multiple different decks, but I think it's also their own power level. So, um... I think hmm, Bone Crusher versus Chandra is like so close that I'm willing to just call them tied. <laughs> um, Lightning Bolt is up next. 
I'm typing in lightning bolt for people who are watching a Magic the Gathering video as though they don't know what lightning bolt is. Um, S tier, but low S tier. If you don't get a lightning bolt, you can supplement that with, you know, a lightning strike or a shock variant or something like that. And you'll probably be fine, but I don't want to understate like how much better three damage for one mana is than three damage for two mana or two damage for one mana. You know, lightning bolt is the king of what it does. There was some discussion about roto draft because lightning bolt almost always gets picked in the first round or second round of roto drafting. And there was some discussion about whether people were picking it too highly. I think roughly these four cards here, plus Fabled the Mirror Breaker, are in the conversation. And however you value those, uh, you can pick or choose. So I don't think it's wrong to value Lightning Bolt higher than these. I don't think it's wrong to value Chandra higher or Glory Bringer or Fable. Fable should probably be number one. But um, Lightning Bolt is significantly better than a Shock variant uh, by, by a wide enough degree that... Um, I don't think it's correct to say that like you you shouldn't be first picking a <laughs> lightning bolt. It's just very powerful. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, play with fire. Shock variant. Here's where we get to the uh, oh all of these cards are roughly the same segment. <laughs> um, play with fire is a shock with like the most minor upside we can think of. Shock is a fine card, notably worse than lightning bolt, but still just like decent removal. Uh, one mana spells also get a boost from a lot of different things like your Bedlam Revelers, your Dreadhorde Arcanists, just anything that cares about casting spells or filling up the graveyard is going to care a lot about one mana spells, even if they're not the most efficient lightning bolts out there. This is like a high B, like a shock is a shock. The removal spells are going to take high parts, uh, high points in each of their categories, and they're all going to be roughly close. It's kind of hard to have a D level removal spell, but maybe we find one. Um, Unholy Heat design mistake <laughs> uh has modern horizons uh, if you ever see a card and you're like is this a design mistake look at the symbol and see if it's from a modern horizon set because odds are it's all it is or its name is a workish bowmaster this is a level removal and i think very high a level removal probably the best red removal spell behind lightning bolt because this one if you put in any amount of work to get delirium can clear out the biggest creatures in the cube besides like uh titan of industry you know and it hits planeswalkers which is pretty huge uh, this card was a saving grace for me in that recent Roto draft because it let me clear off things like Vorinclexes and stuff like that that I couldn't kill with my normal, like, cheapy removal spell. So Unholy Heat doesn't really make a lot of sense from a design perspective. I think there's an alchemy version that only deals four damage with Delirium, and that feels more appropriate. But yeah, let's throw a six on there. That makes sense. <laughs> um, best red removal spell behind Lightning Bolt. Uh, this is Flame Blessed Bolt, I believe. Yeah, so this is a shock that doesn't hit players, um, but exiles the creature instead. Anytime you have a burn spell that can't go directly to your opponent's face, it's going to get a lower grade than the ones that can, even if it has some different upside. So, I mean, it is a shock. Shock is fine, but I'm going to put this one below, like, the spell's payoffs, because it's one of the more replaceable shocks. And exile is nice. Like, there are things that come back from the graveyard, recursive creatures, so it's great to have some exile floating around, but we don't want too much of it. Part of the reason we passed on the Smite the Deathless card from Lord of the Rings is that we just didn't want to overload on Exile effects. Lightning Strike is another strictly worse Bolt. It is a Bolt for an extra mana, but you know what? Bolt is hyper-efficient, and Lightning Strike does a good job. I'm going to put this at the bottom of A. It's just the next best thing to Lightning Bolt, really. Um, if, when you're talking about all the two mana like deal threes, I think Lightning Strike is just the best. Goes to face, instant speed, no stipulations on what it can target. It's just obviously better, I think. A Braid is up next. This is not the uh, A Braid art that I prefer, but um, that's the one that came up. A Braid is. Th this is honestly like probably low B to C territory removal. It's still going to kill a creature, but it doesn't hit Planeswalkers, which is always a plus for a red removal spell or red burn spell. It doesn't hit players, doesn't hit Planeswalkers, and destroying an artifact is not super impressive. We've talked a little bit about that in other videos, how it's nice to have a couple safety valves, um, like things that can destroy artifacts and enchantments, so that the good ones like Great Henge don't just uh, go completely rampant, but... Um, it doesn't come up enough that like a braid is an all-star card. The flexibility really matters. This is basically just 
another lightning strike, but a more stringent one that like 10% of games just completely destroys your opponents like worm coil engine or something like that. So not that using a braid on worm coil is even that good. So passable removal spell if you need a removal spell, but one of the more unexciting ones. Volcanic Spite. Um, okay, so this card is here. It, it's got a little bit of distract and text because of the battle thing. We only have two battles in the entire cube, so that's not a huge thing. But it is technically strictly better than... Um, uh, what what is the fiery something fiery impulse i don't i don't know what the name of the card is off the top of my head but the one that does the same exact thing as this without the battle text we were playing that card this is a strict upgrade to it this is another abrade variant you know it kills a creature it hits a planeswalker it can hit a battle but i don't think that's ever really happening and then you get to improve your hand a little bit which is nice so better than a braid because it can hit a planeswalker but still on the lower end of removal um, if you need removal, you need it, but I think I'm going to put it like right here, just a little bit lower than the efficient shock. Um, yeah, I mean, arbitrary stuff, right? All right, electrostatic blast. This is an alchemy card, so let's just uh, walk through it real quick. Uh, two mana, deals two to any target. When you cast your next instant or sorcery, period, exile the top three of your library, and you may play one of those cards. Easy to forget about this. Uh, this is one of those cards that like, if you printed this text in paper, it would just work. The only problem being that there's like a memory issue since this doesn't last until end of turn. It's just the next spell you cast, the next instant or sorcery triggers it. So you might like not cast an instant or sorcery for three turns and then forget that this effect was in play. So that's why it's a quote unquote digital only card. Um, I do forget about it a lot. So, um, you know, I, I guess you wouldn't want a lot of effects like this floating around in paper. I do think it's a very powerful card. I think it's one of Red's best kind of like inefficient cards because it, it doesn't deal three like the lightning strikes do but it does deal like it, it's just a shock that draws you into another card later on down the line and it has some sequencing problems with it if you've ever played with it but it is powerful the upside is there you don't need a ton of instants and sorceries to justify playing it i almost want to put it in a tier because i think it actually plays out like that you know kill a creature draw a card is just incredible for two mana and this doesn't kill every creature but even if you have to double up two removal spells and then you get your card back at some point it kind of makes up for the fact that you had to two for one yourself so yeah i'll go ahead and stick this in low a i think it performs extremely well it's also an easy way to get double prowess triggers on some of your red creatures stoke the flammies Good card. Um, Stoke the Flames is one of the more expensive removal spells, but Convoke ob obviously helps with that a lot. Not a ton of ways to go wide and red, but your Legion War Bosses and stuff like that, um, they can put creatures on board. Your young Pyromancer obviously loves this card. It, it's good. It's a good removal spell, but nothing higher than like a B. You usually want the more efficient stuff first. So let's just go ahead and stick it right below the, the Shock and the Lightning Strike variant. It feels like an appropriate spot. Faithless Luden. So, oh, oh no, you know we have to. You know we have to. There we go. Okay, so, <laughs> so Faithless Luden is interesting because it is more of a synergy card than it is just a blatantly powerful card. If you just put this in the deck and you have no way to use your graveyard or no incentive for casting spells, it's just a dead average card. It's actually card disadvantage the first time and then recoups that card disadvantage by having flashback but if you have any amount of synergy at all with this card it goes up quite a bit and you can just look through this section here and look at all the different ways that this benefits other cards right it triggers all of your prowessy stuff like your young pyro and your pro actual straight up prowess creatures it can dump your graveyard matters cards in the graveyard like your phoenix um, it's a cheap spell to trigger like your Dreadhorde Arcanist, your Moonville Regent, stuff like that. It can fill up the graveyard for Lava Mancer. It can get Delirium on board. It does a lot, right? And that's not counting like blue spells, payoffs, like Thing in the Ice and stuff like that. So I think this is a high synergy card and it is a very easy card to pick early and have anything to do with it. Um, would I take Faithless Looting over some of these other cards here i think it goes in more decks yeah i'm gonna put it at low a maybe high b is appropriate would i first pick no i would not first pick faithless Luden. okay high b feels appropriate 
it makes a lot of different things tick for very little cost. Um, one of the biggest costs is staring at this art, but we did get the new art uh, for it, or the old art rather, so you don't have to look at this anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I would first pick Faithless Luden, so that's going to go ahead and bump it down to B for me, but I think it's a nice little glue card for a lot of different strategies. It's just easy to pick up and find something to do with it. Strangle is up next. One mana for three damage. Um, hard to argue with Strangle. I think this is going to be like A tier removal. It's not Lightning Bolt. It doesn't go to face, but it does kill, you know, way above its um, casting call. Like this, this kills one drops, two drops, three drops very easily, and then occasionally kills like some fours and fives. So I think this is just solid removal. It's not as good as the best possible removal, but it, it does a fine job. It's efficient. Pillar of Flame is another shock variant. This one is a sorcery, but it deals two damage to anything. So you can hit walkers, you can hit battles if you want to hit battles, and it exiles kind of like the Flame Blessed Bolt. So sorcery speed, this is kind of like in the same exact category as Flame Blessed Bolt. Uh, probably just a little bit lower. Lower because it's not an instant, higher because it hits players if you need it to, but I value instant over sorcery enough to kind of make this the divide. Ren's Resolve. Um, this could also just be Reckless Impulse, by the way, if you prefer Reckless Impulse. So we just change it over because we think this art's pretty cool. So um, Reckless Impulse, or <laughs> Ren's Resolve, is just a decent little red draw spell. In fact, let's talk about Light Up the Stage at the same time because they have the same effect. There's uh, They're both XL the top two and you can play them until the end of your next turn. Uh, basically the same card, light up the stage is more expensive, but in a deck that can consistently deal damage, it's least less expensive. Ren's Resolve, I usually give the nod over light up the stage because every deck can use a Ren's Resolve, but light up the stage is usually cornered into aggressive decks. Like you could put Ren's Resolve in a Gruel deck or mid rangey deck or a spells deck that doesn't have a lot of creatures and just use it as a draw to. Light up the stage is just a bit too expensive at three mana, so you really need to make sure Spectacle's going. These are decent little draw spells. Um, I actually think I'm coming down on light up the stage the more that we get just incidental card advantage. Cards like Abbot of Carol Keep that add to the board or play with the board and give you some sort of advantage kind of edge out light up the stage over time. So I'm going to put light up the stage down in C and Ren's Resolve in like low B. Usually decks that need card advantage have card advantage and don't necessarily need these effects, but they're they're fine. They do a good job. On, on, obviously, if you're always an aggro deck, Light Up the Stage is like somewhere up here because it's so efficient, but you do end up in decks where you can't get Spectacle reliably, and that knocks it down a fair bit for me. Um, Obliterate and Bolt is up next. Uh, four damage to a creature or planeswalker exile it. We used to go back and forth about whether we liked Lava Coil or Thunder and Rebuke. One of them exiled, one of them hit planeswalkers, and then they printed this, which is just the best of both worlds. So uh, that solved that issue for us. It also punches up to four drops. The fact that this is a two mana spell that kills a lot of greens, four fours and stuff like that is very nice. Even kills five drops like Glorybringer, but you already died. So I think this is a high pick removal spell. Um, it doesn't go to face. But I do like that it kills most of the creatures in the cube that aren't just giant green creatures. So I'm going to put it above play with fire here and just stick it at the top end of B. Incendiary flow. Incendiary flow. Here we go. Um, fine card. It's 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 another bolt variant. Like <laughs> uh, I'll just put it below volcanic spite. It's not an instant, but it can hit players. Actually, hitting players for three is a pretty big nod. So let's just go, let's go here. Being able to hit players is huge when it's an actual bolt instead of a shock. That That's just sometimes the difference between killing your opponent on the spot and needing one more spell to send to their face. But um, it doesn't hit Planeswalkers, notably. Actually, this one might have been eroded. Let's, let's look at it. It might hit any target. Yeah, it does hit any target. So yeah, uh, significantly better than a lot of these other things. Um, the fact that it goes to face, I think, gives it the nod over Obliterate and Bolt, which deals more damage, but doesn't hit opponents. Royal Eruption. Another Bolt. Collect it. These cards are all the same card. <laughs> we, we can argue back and forth. I'm going to put this one directly in the middle 
because even though um, it doesn't exile, even though it doesn't deal four damage, you can kick this card and just lava axe your opponent to finish off the game. So I don't know. You can rank these removal spells however you want. They're all kind of roughly in the same spot. Uh, Nahiri's Warcrafting. So this is an interesting one. I think um, we've had a couple people say this is mediocre, and it probably is. Uh, the the problem, the quote unquote problem with this card is that a lot of times if you're just firing this off on turn three or you're killing like a five five or something like that, like a big creature, which is what this card is here to do, you are not actually getting much of an advantage. It's kind of hard sometimes to fire this off and play the card that you get if you only exile like one or two cards. So realistically, it's a three drop removal spell. You don't want to play on turn three that often because you're going to miss out on something. But I do think it's important to have at least like one big red spell that can kill big creatures because sometimes your lightning bolts just don't get it done and you get brick walled by a love struck beast so i like having a spell like this whether or not it's nahiri's warcraft and or soul seer or render and flame or whatever you want it to be like the slot is fine this one's sorcery speed it's double red it's got a couple knocks against it but the upside of being able to get an extra card out of it comes up enough that i think it's just fine i will say it's like in the c category um it's a high c because it's kind of hard for five ma or three mana deal five to be anything worse than just like a one for one against an equivalent creature so it does a job it's just not super efficient and it's not a guaranteed thing that you get an extra card out of it high upside for sure um but the the floor is a little bit lower than you would like dragons invasion of tarkir we caught magma jet for this card it's interesting because it's it's basically a sorcery speed deal to maybe you have glory bringer in your hand and it deals three instead but the upside of it is that you just get this game winning dragon right you have to invest some amount of resources into getting it flipped and battles are just altogether interesting for cubes because they change the way you have to play kind of like a planeswalker but a planeswalker you could ignore <laughs> if you wanted to so it, it adds a lot of decision making this the, the the floor on this one is a little bit low you know it just deals two damage to anything for two mana at sorcery speed that's not super impressive or anything like that but the mini game of trying to get defiant thunder mall is usually worth it and we were already like i said playing magma jet there's actually a couple of people who came back and said they would have rather had magma jet in their deck than this card so it's still up in the air about how important it is but i think the baseline is fine the upside is super strong and the play patterns are interesting enough that I'm okay just having it around like it's a fine card. But it is kind of low tier. It is worth noting it's a battle for the Delirium cards as well if you want to pitch them to like your uh, Faithless Loot and stuff like that. Probably around where Pillar of Flame is. Mm, it's got much higher upside than Pillar. But yeah, let's just put it slightly above the other one mana deal twos. Embercleave. So me and Chris did a Jank Diver... Um, deep dive podcast episode about what we consider to be the power nine of our card pool you know just working with the arena card pool what would be our power nine and at the time i put ember cleave on that list but i think other colors are even and out and that this was at a time where red white aggro was just completely dominant um i think ember cleave still belongs in s tier for me and the reason for that is it, you could first pick this card and just go a super streamlined red aggressive deck. The reason I like given Ember Cleave an S is because it is the type of card that can win you a game that no other card on this list could. And it can do it just out of nowhere, right? When you attack with a Bone Crusher and you Ember Cleave it, you're threatening 10 damage just off the bat um, through blockers, right? And a lot of times you come down to these situations where you're like, well, I hope my opponent doesn't have Ember Cleave. <laughs> if they do, I lose. If not, I still get to play the game, right? And some amount of the time, they will have Ember Cleave and you'll die to it. So it's it's that type of card, even though it does require you to construct a deck that can um, get it down for like two or three mana, which if you're against a heavy control deck that's able to pick off all of your threats, Ember Cleave kind of exacerbates how bad that matchup is for you. But I think there are enough times where Ember Cleave is just like, oops, I win, that I have to still give it an S tier, even though instead of putting it like up here, it's kind of like shrinking a little bit and could easily fall down here somewhere. So uh, believe in the Cleave. Two more cards. We've got the lands. 
Shatter Skull Smashing. This is the MDFC. Very, very good. This is going to be A tier for sure for me. Where do I want to put it in A tier? It's such a safe pick. It's such a safe pick. Like, if you're a red deck, whether you're red spells, red aggro, gruel, whatever, red white, boros, you can put this card in your deck and it's going to be great. It's also a way to artificially up your land count for like the Omnath decks without actually, you know, giving up a spell slot. Um, I think the card has such low opportunity cost that I'm going to go ahead and put it behind the most efficient creatures here and just say that anytime you can take Shatter Skull Smashing and improve your mana base, you're going to be better off for it. And that kind of goes for Sokenzon too. This one has lower opportunity cost, but a much lower ceiling as well as it just makes two 1-1s. One this is a, like a take it or leave it type card, and it's interesting because as far as its importance in the cube goes, it's like a C or a D. If we ever need to free up room and we just can't come up with a cut for anything else, we probably look at Sokenzon and be like, we could take it or leave it. But while it is in the cube, it performs like uh, an A or a very high B. So I'm going to put it at low B because if you use a draft or a pick on this card, it's going to make your deck 100% of the time and it's not going to cost you anything. And the decks that want their lands to have some sort of added utility are also the decks that want their lands to turn into creatures, right? The red aggressive decks love when you can just trade in a land for some sort of extra value and that's what Sokenzon lets you do so uh low a probably draft it like in the b range and its importance in the cube is somewhere much lower so it's a, it's a harder one to talk about it's not like Aganjo or Odawara where I'm like oh these are slam dunk cards that we should be using cube slots on and you should pick them highly this is more like an inoffensive one that I think should make your deck 100% of the time if you draft it, but doesn't necessarily need to take a cube slot. We could talk about cube equity some other time. So that's going to go ahead and do it for red cards. Did, did I do good? Did I get through it faster? It's kind of easy when all of the cards you're talking about are just the same card with like little tweaks, <laughs> like these little clusters of burn spells. Um, yeah, so I mean, this gives you my thoughts on where I am with red, which at one point was our dominant color and I think is no longer the case. I think that courtesy goes to green, which we'll talk about next time. But realistically, my my like top five is something like this, although I will take most of these other red cards over Glorybringer. So um, that's why I'm knocking Glorybringer down. I knew I was going to rank Lightning Bolt and Chandra and Ember Cleave higher, so put Glorybringer a little bit farther down. And then you've got like your most efficient removal spells, your kind of value cards and then just all of your bread and butter effects and curve fillers and spells payoffs and stuff like that down here you're getting to like replacement level cards and then things that actively either need to come out or doing something super cute that's supported but not necessarily the best thing you can be doing in the cube so that's it for red what do you think do you want to fill out your own tier list well you can do that there's a link down below wherever you're watching this to this tier list you just have to clear it out and then you can fill in your own tier list and share it in our discord which is also linked down below we will be back with green which is right now our best color in the cube and uh we'll talk about why that is and what steps we took to try to even things out when we get to that video so that's going to be it for us thanks for watching uh hope you enjoy this sort of content my name is timothy with jank Gaming, and i will see you all next time